wonder what your favourite subject in school was. <laughs> Mine was history. I've always loved history. I found it interesting. I found it fascinating. I found it useful. And I think history is great because it can teach us a lot of things. We can learn from history both the good things that have happened and the bad things that could be avoided. And sometimes you can't really face the future unless, unless you learn the lessons from the past. And that's where history comes in and is so incredibly helpful. And this is why we are going to embark on Sunday nights at looking at some of the historical revivals in the Bible. Just looking at some of the awakenings that have happened. Because I think they can do exactly the same thing to us. They can inspire us and encourage us. And while we're not looking for a template that we're going to copy, I think there's some underlying principles that never change. And you know, days like ours are incredibly ripe, in my opinion, for a time of revival to sweep through the church, not just in the UK, but worldwide. A revival that will revolutionise our whole public life. And this is why looking at some of the past revivals in Scripture are incredibly helpful to us. This is not one of those copy and paste situations where we impose something that happened there and we try to do that. But we can extract some incredible principles that I think are unchanging and eternal that can really help us as we seek to follow God. And this is the kind of journey that we're embarking on. I love what Warren Wearsby is saying. He said, look, we must never assume today that because our churches are growing and our ministries are prospering, that God's people are necessarily at their best. There are times when corporate renewal of our dedication to Christ is the right thing to do. And I think there's a lot of truth in that. We might feel pretty happy because we're comparing ourselves with other churches or other Christians, and we might pat ourselves on the back and think we're doing great, but are we truly living the fullness of everything that God has for us as disciples of Jesus, and as churches that represent Jesus in our local communities? And my answer would be no, there must be more, there is more to this, and I am longing for that sense of fullness that is available with that. And this is where those revivals and renewals come in. Just as the word revival suggests, it applies primarily to Christians, to disciples, not to unbelievers. Unbelievers need to have a, a, an experience of, of spiritual transformation from death to life but the believers need revival because maybe they have fallen asleep the non-believers need a resurrection so we're going to spend a little bit of time tonight in 2 chronicles chapters 34 and 35 looking at the history of josiah and his revival his reforms and we're going to pick up some of the things that are in there. Let's start by reading the, uh, some of the text. Uh, so this is 2 Chronicles chapter 34. Josiah was eight years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem for 31 years. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father David, not turning aside to the right or to the left. In the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, he began to seek the God of his father David. In his twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of high places, Asherah poles, carved idols, and cast images. Under his direction, the altars of the Baals were torn down and cut into pieces. It really starts with a really unpromising background. Josiah's background was that such a, <laughs> a, a, a terrible legacy that he received from his ancestors. His grandfather was probably one of the most horrendous kings in Judah. And his father, so his grandfather was Manasseh, his father was Ammon. And they both brought destruction and spiritual compromise upon the nation. So everything about his background didn't mitigate for him to be a particularly good spiritual king. But he renounces that. And he starts in an incredible way with a different role model. It wasn't his granddad, it wasn't his father, it was the greatest king that the people of God have had, King David. A man with flaws. 
but a man after God's own heart. And Josiah, right from a very young age, and again, this is an incredible truth, it doesn't matter how old or young we are, we can have a deeply passionate pursuit for God, and if we embrace the right kind of influence in our lives, and the kind of the good role models, the world is yet to see the spiritual impact that we could have on those around us. And this was the case for a very young king coming through the lineage of a compromised series of kings. And the first thing that actually Josiah does, he just renounces idolatry. Right from a very young age, he had a passion for God. It says that he walked in the ways of the Lord. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. He had a spiritual passion that was really set on pleasing God, living for the audience of one, wanting to make sure that the number one priority in his life was to worship, honor, and glorify God. And he pursues that with everything within him. I love the fact that he doesn't bring any blames or excuses. He could have said, look, I'm too young to do this. He could have said, who am I to smash all the idols and remove all the spiritual compromise? I'm only a teenage boy. But he doesn't. He could have said, look, I'm just going to keep things as they are. I'm going to keep the status quo. I'm going to keep on going like my grandfather, like my father. We're just going to keep on going. Why make trouble for myself? But he didn't do that. He tackles it head on and starts with probably one of the most difficult challenges that he had. He tackles the spiritual compromise in the nations, in the nation. People have started following other gods and started living, living with idols in their lives and started worshipping idols in their lives. And as a result, they departed from God. And Josiah makes sure that right at the very beginning of his move for crying out for revival and renewal amongst his people was to actually remove any hindrance that was pulling people away from worshipping and obeying God. It seems that he probably spent about four years before he started doing this, pursuing God. That's always telling. If the fruit of pursuing God in devotion leads to an action that is radical, uncompromising, brave, obviously it paid off. And that was the case in Josiah's life. He's so brave. This is a strong thing to do. This group would have had so much opposition, there would have been people kicking off left, right and centre. How dare you do this? How dare you challenge what we are doing? How dare you challenge and smash up what we worship? And yet, he does it. And there's no delay. There's no superficiality. He doesn't just do little uh, strategic PR exercise in which he says, oh, you know what? We're just going to stop worshipping those idols once a month or just maybe one or two. No, he goes a full just attack on it. Letting go of them, dismissing them, destroying them, all gone. And this is because right at the very heart of this renewal movement, it's all about worship. And Josiah knows this. This is not just about the places. This is not about those uh, idols of carved wood, of carved stone. This is not just about damaging those altars. This is about the heart of the people. This is about the worship that they were betraying God and following other idols. Let me ask you a question tonight. I'm asking that question myself. What kind of idolatrous baggage do I need to let go of in my life? What is it in my life that hinders my wholehearted pursuit of God? What is it that stops me from obeying Him? If there ever was a good time to make those changes, I really wonder if the time is now. Let's do what Josiah did. Let's renounce idolatry as we seek to experience revival. The second thing that he did, he reconnected with the temple. If we begin reading from verse 8, in the, 
18th year of Josiah's reign, to purify the land and the temple, he sent Shaphan, son of Azaliah, and Maseah, the ruler of the city, with Joah, the son of Joahaz, the recorder, to repair the temple of the Lord his God. They went to Hilkiah the high priest and gave him the money that had been brought into the temple of God, which the Levites, who were the doorkeepers, had collected from the people of Manasseh. Ephraim and the entire remnant of Israel, and from all the people of Judah and Benjamin and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They entrusted it to the men appointed to supervise the work on the Lord's temple. The main men paid the workers, repaired and restored the temple. And it goes on. Josiah reconnects with the temple. This was incredibly significant. We've already seen that Josiah's primary passion was the restoration of worship. And the temple was the means by which the worship took place. The motivation was the restoration of worship. The means was the restoration of the temple. And I love the detail that goes in there. First of all, he appoints key people who are going to be overseeing all that work of restoring things in order for worship to take place again. There was a need of finances to be given. There was a need to recruit skilled people who needed to restore some of the elements that were part of the worship in the temple. Everything is being carefully thought out because Josiah wanted to make sure that he provided an environment where people could gather together and connect with God. And that's why he begins this reconnection with the temple. And everything is part of this. Planning, establishing teams, recruiting skilled people. It seems to be quite an administrative task, but this is deeply spiritual because this is shaping the future worship of God's people. And again, I'm asking myself the question, do we need to reconnect again? Obviously, we don't have a temple. Obviously, we don't believe in one sense that a church building is that significant to our worship. But I believe that being together as church, being united together as God's people, is so incredibly important to our worship. And I'm wondering whether at this time when we're actually very scattered, isn't this a time when God is calling us to reconnect again? Even if it's through Zoom, even if it's through joining the WhatsApp groups that are there, even if it's making some of the calls and serving one another through buying some medication and buying some food that is necessary. Isn't this a time to reconnect again with God's people and the environments through which we can worship together? That's a really good question that is buzzing in my mind right now. It's also about investing resources of everything that God has gifted us with. Am I making them available to the rest of my spiritual community so they can benefit from that and be edified and be built up and be encouraged and being able to connect with God? Because that's what it means. The third thing. So it really starts with removing and renouncing idolatry. It's reconnecting with the temple and begins with responding to scripture. While they were repairing the temple, they find the scriptures uh, that were really neglected and thrown about. And there's an incredible reaction to this. Look at verse 14. While they were bringing out the money that had been taken into the temple of the Lord, Hilkiah, the priest, found a book of the law, that's the scriptures, that the Lord had been given through had, had given to Moses. Hilkiah said to Shaphan, the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the temple of the Lord. And he gave it to Shaphan. And Shaphan took the book to the king and reported to him, your officials are doing everything that has been commanded to them. They have paid up the money that was in the temple and have entrusted to the supervisors and workers. Then Shaphan, the secretary, informed the king, Hilkiah, the priest, had given me a book. And Shaphan read from it in the presence of the king. When the king heard the words of the law, he tore his robes and he gave his orders to Hilkiah, Ahikam, son of Shaphan, Abdon, son of Micah, Shaphan, the secretary, and Asaiah, the king's attendant. Go and inquire of the Lord for me and the remnant in Israel and Judah about what is written in this work that has been found. 
It's an amazing discovery. And as a result of discovering the scriptures, there is a great reaction and a great response to what they hear and read. And it's really interesting, the, the sequence of events. It starts with removing the idols. It starts with restoring and reconnecting with the temple. And only then they find the book through which God is beginning to speak to them. I find it in my life so very often repentance precedes revelation from God. Sometimes I need to turn my priorities around. I need to let my heart be changed in order to hear from God again. And this is what seems to be happening here. And they discover the book, and what I love uh, about Josiah, that he, he's, and I don't know whether it's a word I've coined, but he's convictable. It means that he, he's allowing the Spirit of God through the scriptures to change his behavior and mentality and challenge his heart about his state. And convictability, comes through humility and curiosity. Humility to accept when God's word challenges us. And it's unpleasant. Let me tell you, it's deeply unpleasant. I hate it. I, I kind of have this love-hate affair with God's word. I, I love the fact that it, 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 it wakes me up and challenges me. But sometimes when God's word gets under my skin, I, I don't like it. It challenges me. But I want to stay convictable. And in order to do that, I need to be humble. I need to be able to take it. It's funny how sometimes, you know, when, we, when something's being pointed out to us, we can just kick off and, mm, who are you to tell me? And we're just covered in excuses. Oh, I'm better. But you haven't seen, you've not. A convictable heart is willing to just take it with humility. And then there's a curiosity. Uh, Josiah could have dismissed it, saying, oh, it's an old, dusty book. What do we need that for? But he doesn't. So he's listening, and he wants to lean in and hear more. And he sends them, and they end up going to a prophetess that is actually, uh, her name was Huldah, and she actually unpacks what God is saying prophetically for now. And again, this is why it's so important to, to get into God's Word, not so that we could learn the theory of it, but so that God's Word could speak to us and bring revelation that's practical for us right here, right now. And as a result of it, there's a real response that happens with a whole community. Listen to what it says in verse 29, And the king called together all the elders of Judah in Jerusalem, he went up to the temple of the Lord with the men of Judah, the people of Jerusalem, the priests, the Levites, all the people from the last to the greatest. He read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which had been found in the temple of the Lord. The king stood by the pillar and renewed the covenant in the presence of the Lord to follow the Lord and keep his commands, regulations and decrees with all his heart and all his soul and to obey the words of the covenant written in the book. Then he made everyone in Jerusalem and Benjamin pledge themselves to it. The people of Jerusalem did this in accordance to the covenant of God, the God of their fathers. Josiah continued to remove all the detestable idols. So I love the way they don't just discover the scriptures, but they respond to the scriptures. And the first outcome is he gathers the leaders and the leaders set an example by responding to the scriptures. But it's not just for the leaders. The second thing is there's a community sense of unity as they all come together under God's word. This is why I think it's so important when we gather together that we come together to hear God's word being preached and taught. People say, oh, I can listen to the podcast. I can catch up on, uh, on YouTube or I can catch up on uh, later on. There's something incredibly powerful as coming together in unity as God's people and responding to God's word as is being brought to us publicly. The third outcome, there's a renewal of the covenant. Again, there's a practical change that comes out of hearing God's word. It's not just, oh, now we know what God's word says. No, it's now we're going to do what God's word says. And last but not least, 
There's a real continuation of life application. So again, as a result of reading God's word, this is Josiah who moved all the detestable idols. So he continued his pursuit of doing the good work of getting connected with God and eliminating any idolatrous influences in his life. How about for me and you digging out God's word and digging in afresh? How about allowing God's word to bring that radical transformation for us all as a community of believers? So it's not just isolate ones and twos that are impacted by God's word, but what about us all, CFM? What about us all as a community of Christ followers in this region? Being the kind of people that say, I'm gonna be changed. I'm gonna be convictable. I'm going to come under the authority of this word and let this word speak to me, convict me, change me, and show me how to live differently. Because that's an incredible move towards coming before God and letting him bring about a fresh revival and renewal. And then the last but not the least thing is as a renewal of their identity. Chapter 35, verse 1, Josiah celebrated a Passover to the Lord in Jerusalem, and a Passover lamb was slaughtered on the 14th day of the first month. He appointed a priest to their duties and encouraged them in the service of the Lord's temple. He said to the Levites, and he instructed all Israel, and who had been consecrated to the Lord, put the sacred ark in the temple that Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, had built. It is not to be carried about on your shoulders. Now serve the Lord your God and his people Israel. They have this moment of renewing their identity. Our identity, you and I know this, our, our identity is so significant to us. It shapes all our thinking and our actions. And it's the same for the people of God. And very often the people of God had these different feasts who were meant to remind them of their identity. There were brilliant markers in their annual calendar that would enable them to look back in history in order to look up at God and worship and reconnect with him. And by doing that, they would reaffirm and rediscover and even teach the younger generations what their identity was. And for them, the Passover was probably the most significant worship event in the year. It's because the Passover reminded them that as the people of God, they were once slaves in Israel, oppressed by Pharaoh, and because of God's grace and through God's power, they were taken out of the slavery from Israel, from Egypt. As God's people, they were taken out of that place and later on brought into the promised land. That was an incredibly powerful reminder. The ark was again very significant. And while the ark had been moved around to different places and probably even ignored and found somewhere in a corner full of dust, again Josiah is saying, look, this is gonna be put here, it's gonna be stable, it's here to stay, and it's gonna be central as a reminder of God's power and faithfulness in our lives. So everything about their identity was being reaffirmed, reformed. They were being reminded of it all. And this was a significant step. Why was it significant? Because it was meant to generate humility. You couldn't be cocky when you had to remind yourself that you were once a slave in Egypt who couldn't get out of her. Wasn't it for a mighty hand of God who brought you out. And your heart would be filled with humility. We couldn't do it. They would say, God did it. There's no arrogance. There's no self-sufficiency. Just dependency and humility. And the other reason why this was significant is in order to generate gratitude. So that they really would remember how thankful they should be for what God had done for them. It also should generate trust. 
because they would remember that in the midst of all the challenging situations around in their lives, they could truly trust God because God was the one that brought them out of Egypt. It was also meant to generate ultimately worship because the one who was gracious enough, the one whose love was so amazing, the one whose power was so great, deserves to be worshipped as the Almighty God, the most beautiful one. And that's why the Passover and the celebration of it and the restoration of the Ark as a central piece as part of their worship would have been so significant in them rediscovering their identity afresh. And once again this connects with us as God's people. We were once spiritually in our Egypt in sin, away from God, slaves to sin and Satan with no hope of being delivered through our own powers. And yet Jesus, through his death on the cross and through his resurrection from the dead, which we've just celebrated, is coming and taking us out of our spiritual, sinful Egypt into the promised land of a relationship with God. Uh, is this still central to our lives? Are we still... In all of grace, is grace still amazing? Is God worthy to be worshipped because of everything that he's done in our lives and where he's taken us from and what he's done in us? Surely, this is an incredible moment where once again we can just stop and taking it afresh and celebrate and come with a response of worship. We need to realise that grace is amazing and God is our deliverer and we need to celebrate that like we've never done it before because he really is worth it. So all those four different amazing stages of that journey for revival to break out in the nation are relevant to us as well. We are called to renounce our idols and maybe it's just time to have a look at your own life, like I'm going to do with mine, and think, what needs to go out? What do I need to cut off? Maybe this is a time to reconnect again with the temple. Maybe it's time to submit myself to connecting with God's people, with the church, with CFM, with my spiritual family, and throw myself right in. Not stay on the edges, not go half-hearted, but go full in. Maybe this is an opportunity to assess how I respond to scripture. Am I reading the scriptures daily? Am I meditating upon them? Are they shaping me? Am I different because of the scriptures? Let's allow them to change us. Most importantly, let's reaffirm our identity. Let's remember whose we are. Let that bring encouragement in the midst of the confusion and the challenges that are around us. But also let us come with a real desire to worship him and make him known to other people. I truly believe if some of those things would be part of our life, something of an awakening would be brought by his Holy Spirit into our lives. And this is what I'm praying for. Professor James K. Smith wrote a uh, it, about that sense of preparation for revival using a very, very interesting analogy. And this is what he said. While we can't, and you know, we can't, we can't make revival happen, we can be in a posture that welcomes revival. Here is his analogy. I cannot choose to fall asleep. The best I can do is choose to put myself in a posture and a rhythm that welcomes sleep. I lie down in bed on my left side with my knees drawn up, close my eyes and breathe slowly, putting my plans out of my mind. But the power of my will or consciousness just stops there. I want to go to sleep and I've chosen to climb into bed, but in another sense, sleep is not something under my control or at my beck and call. I call up the visitation of sleep by imitating the breathing and posture of a sleeper. Sleep is a gift to be received, not a decision to be made. And yet, 
It is a gift that requires a posture of reception, a kind of active welcome. And this is what my heart is longing for, for myself. To have that posture of reception, to have that kind of active welcome in which I am saying, God, would you renew me? Would you revive me? Would you do this work in our church? Would you do this in our nation? Would you do this to the ends of the earth? Let's pray together. Holy Spirit, we thank you that the scriptures are so helpful to us to shed light on occasions in history where groups and nations even have been so awakened to a new relationship with God. We thank you that what was possible then is possible now. The time is as ripe as it's ever been. In the midst of the turmoil we find ourselves in, we are crying out, Lord, revive me, revive us, revive this nation. We want to live with you and we want to live for you. So help us to live in such a way that we're creating an active permanent posture of expectation while we're allowing the word of God, even the things that we've heard tonight, shape us, change us, challenge us. Help us to throw out any idolatrous ties, anything that hinders our passion for you. Help us to reconnect again as a, as a group of believers. Help us to submit ourselves to the authority of Scripture and allow it to be like a scalpel that cuts a wound in us in order for us to be healed. Help us to rediscover our identity. We are the sons and daughters of God, once enemies, but because of Jesus, adopted as heirs. Oh, what a wonderful news. What a wonderful identity. We are so grateful for that. And I pray that you will help us in the week ahead to continue as we explore together in our life groups. What does it mean to be awakened by you, Holy Spirit? Amen.